Un fuerte aplauso en su memoria. during race two of the Moto3 Junior World Championship. Sadly, it took the life of Reali of Interior Academy's Andres Perez. A young and upcoming talent, the Spaniard succeeded in the European Talent Cup last year by taking two victories and two podiums. Progressing to the Moto3 Junior World Championship for 2018, the 14-year-old showed much promise with some very strong results. So please join us as we pay tribute to Andres Perez. A very good morning from Motorland Aragon in Alcaniz in Spain. It is round five of the FIM CEV Repsol. It's great to have your company. It's baking in sunshine here. We're set for temperatures of around about 37 degrees Celsius here today. My name is Tom Brooks. Alongside me, as ever, is Fran Wild, bringing you the coverage of the day's action here in Alcaniz in Spain. Fran, it's been a very exciting season so far, especially here in Moto2. And, well, the big news really, of course, is that Augusto Fernandez, the nearest championship rival to Jesco Rafin, he's not in the uh, European Moto2 World Champion, uh, European Moto2 Championship anymore. And uh, so that kind of alleviates his sort of nearest rival. Yeah, definitely. I think in a lot of ways that's uh, great news for Rafin. Obviously, it gives him a bit of breathing space. But I think also, you know, there's something to be said of that as well. It's a lot of pressure when you have that and you know it's all on you. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how he deals with that, but so far he's been absolutely solid, so I can't imagine that'll be a problem. But then at least this weekend we don't have Rafine on pole, so maybe there's still a lot of points on the table in this championship, so uh, maybe this will be the start of a fight back. Certainly are, and as you said there, Jesca Rafine not on pole position. That honour actually goes to Edgar Pons. Edgar Pons taking his first pole in the Moto2 European Championship since uh, 2015 back at Jerez. Here is Edgar Pons just going down the back straight uh, in towards the very, very difficult uh, final couple of corners, turns 16 and 17. But it's good to see this for Edgar as well because he's had a, a, a challenging season, I think it's fair to say, so far in, in his return to uh, the European Championship. We expect him to be fighting at the front, but a couple of crashes, a couple of mistakes at Estoril in the first round. Got a little bit better, didn't he, of course, at Valencia, but still wasn't on the same form that we were expecting from him. Yeah, definitely. I think both him and probably the team and the viewers will have been expecting Edgar Pons to be a bit of kind of uh, plug-in-and-play championship challenger right from the first round. Obviously, he's won it before um, and in really good form when he did. Uh, but hopefully now we're going to start to see uh, the best of Pons again back at the front. Obviously, pole's a great way to start and then we'll uh, have to see how the race unfolds. Well, the first one. Well, Pons on pole, but he is third in the championship. However, that deficit is over 50 points. He's got 49 points in third position in the championship. So uh, he is going to have a lot of work to do to try and close that deficit down. You can see that the graphic on the right-hand side of your screen with the results he's had so far this year. Of course, last time out at uh, Catalonia, took a podium in race one, fourth position in race two. So he's been making that steady progress through the, uh, through the field, but it will be good to see him fighting in and amongst the front with that AGR team as well. It's been a, a challenging couple of seasons for them not only in the World Championship, but also here in uh, the European Championship. So let's see what he's going to be able to do, though. But championship leader, Jesko Rafin from Switzerland, lines up alongside him on the front row of the grid. You can see there Jesko's results so far this season. Three wins, five podiums, two pole positions, three wins in succession as well from race two at Estoril all the way up to race one at Catalonia. He's the man on form and he's the man now with, uh, with a lot to lose. Yeah, definitely. But then obviously that that lead looks really substantial. But when you look at even just today, we've got 50 points in play. So uh, everything can uh, can really change very quickly in this championship, especially when uh, quite often classes do have two races a weekend. Obviously, the momentum can swing massively. But uh, we'll have to say, I mean, Rafin so far, like we saw, he's had a few wins in a row and he's just been completely solid, not really made any mistakes, just got everything under control, done exactly what he knew he needed to do when he came back here at the start of the season. And what about Hector Garzo as well? He's had a, a challenging year, I think it's fair to say, as well so far for the Spaniard. We saw, of course, a lot of potential from him last year, finishing on the podium. That victory still eluded him, but it looks as if this year would kind of be the year that he clicked on, really. And it hasn't happened so far. Yeah, definitely. I think he'll be looking for a bit more. 
more and uh, I think he'll definitely be looking to uh, stamp some authority on his teammate a bit more often than he's been able to so far as well. Obviously, Garzo made bigger headlines when he was in the Moto2 World Championship, that replacement ride. Didn't finish, but incredible pace at the Saxon Ring. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it'll be interesting to see with these two. They're so close together again here. So uh, have to see who's going to get the upper hand in the inter-team battle. Well, this is uh, his teammate, Hector Garzo's teammate, Lucas Tulovic, the German rider, turned 18 years old just a couple of weeks ago. Actually received a Jaguar for his 18th birthday. I'll tell you what, I had a Renault Clio for my 18th birthday, so he's lucked him right there. So I don't think I got a car for my 18th, but I did have a 1989 Vauxhall Astra at the time. <laughs> so, you know, some people, uh, some people get all the luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Quite right. This is a really good performance as well. Team Chiatti's Tommaso Marcon, the Italian rider, fifth on the grid. One of the best performances that we've seen in qualifying from the young 18-year-old so far this year. The only speed up on the grid in 2018 as well. Good to see them making those steps forward, lining up in the middle of the second row. And, of course, that team in years gone by was the forward racing junior team. They don't have that status anymore, so they're kind of almost sort of on their own, really. And being the only team that's running that bike, it must be well, a help and a hindrance in many different ways. Yeah, definitely. I think always when you've got a lot more of the same machine on the grid, you have a lot more benchmarks, you have a lot more idea of direction, especially when you've got sort of a team of even two or three riders. It's really, really helpful to be able to compare. But, uh, you know, that's a really good performance, like you said. So obviously they've... Uh, they're not completely stumbling around in the dark. They've got some good form there. It'll be interesting to see if we can hold on to that kind of pace in the race. Certainly will be. This is uh, Mikel Pons, who lines up on the outside of the second row of the grid. You can see that the wind not too much of a factor here so far this weekend. It's going to be interesting to see how that uh, does change over the course of today. It's very, very warm here at Motorland Aragon. Temperatures expected around midday of about 37 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure warm is really the apt, <laughs> apt word for that. Scorching. I tell you what though because I said scorching the other day on another broadcast somewhere and somebody called me out for it saying no that's not scorching it's 35 degrees that's not that hot well, I mean where they're from but where we're from Fran definitely this so far bear in mind in Qatar Argentina with MotoGP this is the hottest race weekend so far and it's just in Aragon which obviously you know hot country but it's really a step above it's very very hot I'm not excited about going outside to get <laughs> the winners today yeah I don't envy you at all in any way shape or form there you can just see here that's uh, Mark Alcoba Lines up on the uh, inside of row number three. Keep an eye out for Mark Alcoba. He's on the Dynavolt uh, junior team machine, the Calix bike. Of course, Dynavolt also in the Moto2 World Championship. So really, really good to see that they're making some steps forward in the European Championship. Of course, you would imagine that that would be the natural progression to move up to the World Championship within the next couple of seasons or so. But it's a case of really sort of having the results and showing that you can uh, do the business, really. Likewise, this man here, Chevier Cardalus, has actually tested a Moto GP bike as well. Had a go on. Uh, Tito Rabat's uh, Ducati GP18. That was back in Jerez in the post-race test. But Chevier, a difficult, difficult season for him so far. He's had a couple of wild cards in Moto2. Again, challenging time for the Andorran there. Yeah, definitely. I think he'll be looking to just kind of just find a little bit more form consistency again this weekend. There's two races as well, so it's a really good kind of situation for you to bank two solid finishes and feel like you've got that confidence back a bit. Because like you said, it's been a bit of a torrid time of late. And what about Alessandro Zaccone then on the Calix? The Italian rider, he is in ninth position on the grid. You can see him there. That one blot in his copybook where he's not finished so far this year was race two at Estoril, and that's where he was fighting inside the top five. He was battling Di Mazzecchi for fourth position in that race, and it was looking like it was going to go the way of Zaccone right until the last lap when he ended up sending it straight to the scene of the accident in the gravel trap. So Zaccone, he's had some good flashes of speed so far this year, but just hasn't been able to put together that consistent package. Yeah, definitely. I think 12th is a little bit unfair on his form, really, at the moment. So we'll uh, we'll have to see if he can... He's been kind of at the fringe of the top 10 quite often, but uh, I think he needs to start really getting towards that top five now. He's had quite a few races to bed in, and uh, he's got some serious speed that he showed us before in uh, the European Supersport class, so have to see what he can do. Certainly will do. Here is Matthias Megle, also on the other Dynavolt junior team machine. Matthias Megle, the German rider, of course, competed in the uh, Moto3 Junior World Championship last year, riding on board that number 21. And it was actually his uh, birthday yesterday. So he turned uh, the grand old age of 18 years old. So happy birthday to uh, Matthias there. And uh, he lines up, as you can see, on the 10th uh, tenth position on the grid, on the fourth row. So uh, not a bad birthday present. It's continually making those steps forward. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, when you're 18 and you're already at this kind of level, I think you're doing all right, really. <laughs> <laughs> 
pretty impressive stuff. Obviously, Dimaseki, a bit more of a veteran, uh, got a few years on uh, on Matias there, but uh, I think he'll be looking to get back into that top five kind of fight that he uh, he showed at the start of the season. And obviously, in Catalonia, difficult second race there. And yeah, I don't know. I think he um, he's shown some really good pace. He's not often had the pace to really go with the front runners, but at least he's been very very consistent and just banked those points. So it's pretty impressive stuff so far. He's got a nice brolly dolly as well. He's got Carmelo Morales on the left-hand side of his picture. Indeed. I'm not sure if we're uh, meant to use that phrase, really. <laughs> it's probably not the politically <laughs> correct term, so apologies if I've upset anybody by using that term. <laughs> but uh, going on to Marcel Brenner then, the Swiss rider. He's been testing left, right and centre as the number 46 to try and find some speed, try and get some performance out of uh, both himself and, of course, try and find the right direction with that Calex. A seventh in the championship, you can see there he's had a few good top ten uh, results. Has hasn't actually been outside of the top 10 so far in 2018, which is a lot more to be said than his 2017 campaign this time last year. But uh, it is good to see him making those steps forward. And, well, he's been a busy boy. He's been riding his Honda at various tracks over in Spain just to try and, as we say, just improve performance, get himself a bit more race fit and uh, get him fighting towards that front a bit more. Yeah, I think just being bike fit is an important thing in itself. And then obviously just feeling confident and riding a lot. So, uh, yeah, and then here we have... Newcomer. A newcomer, yeah. The Polish rider, Peter uh, Bis uh, Bisakiri. Uh, forget the pronunciation on that one as well. It's a bit of a tricky name to uh, pronounce, and he's a newcomer for this weekend, the Polish rider, uh, riding with the Team Styler Bike outfit on board the number 74. So here's your grid then in the Moto2 European Championship. Here's how they line up. It's Edgar Pons on pole position with Jesko Rafin, Hector Garzo alongside. Then it's Tulevic, Marcon, and Mikel Pons on the second row of the grid. Then we have... Uh, Jeremy, uh, sorry, Mark Alcova, rather, I should say, uh, alongside him uh, was Xavier Cardlus and Alessandro Zaccone. Then Matthias Meglet, Dean Secchi, and Marcel Brenner. Then we have the Polish newcomer, uh, Chiodo. Then Roman Fischer, Zerti, Pomares, and Lorenzon towards the end of the grid on row number six. Row seven, Alexander Anin, Chandler Cooper, and Philippe Legallo from France. And Javier Artime, the Spanish rider, rounding out the 22 rider strong grid in the Moto2 European Championship. What do we reckon we're expecting then for this race, Fran? Because it's going to be interesting, really. There's a lot of unpredictability going on, but what's your bet? Who do you think is going to go where? I think, personally, it's possibly going to be a bit of a duel between Pons and Rafi in this one. Maybe not an out-and-out -out battle all the time, but I think those two have got some, uh, some serious pace, and I expect them to be able to pull away and maybe decide it between themselves. But, who knows? Anything can happen. It's a lot earlier in the day than uh, qualifying, so it should be interesting as well to see how that affects it. Absolutely right, and it's going to be interesting to see how it pans over the course of the race. Don't forget, of course, about uh, the number three of Lucas Tulevic and his teammate as well, Hector Garzo. Both of those bikes right up the sharp end of the grid on board the Team Wimu CMS Tech 3 machines, and they're both very fast starters in the race as well. So let's see how they all fare going down towards that first corner. One thing to mention here at the Motorland Aragon circuit, if it is your first time having a look at this circuit, the first corner, it is very, very tight through there. So getting 22 riders going into that corner all battling for the same piece of tarmac it's gonna get it pretty interesting definitely that runoff at turn one can be uh, quite a spectacular place to watch <laughs> especially at the start of the race obviously there's a few different ways to take that as well you've got to choose your line pretty well and see where you're gonna gain the time and also obviously make sure you're not on the outside for someone being a little bit too uh, opportunistic into that first apex but again the tarmac there's a lot of space there so you can at least just run on and collect it and then carry on yeah, we have seen a couple of crashes in the uh, Moto3 GD World Championship there so far this weekend in free practice and in qualifying to name a, a couple of people as well. Hopefully we won't see any of that in this Moto2 race that's coming up very, very shortly. 22 riders going down towards that first corner is uh, going to be very, very exciting and uh, very unpredictable. It's uh, quite spectacular in uh, some ways when you're sat down there uh, as a fan. You can actually hear it when they run on. I remember Danny Pedrosa crashed here in the wet in 2014. You could actually hear the bike skidding really well from that stand. <laughs> so it is a really great place to watch for the drama as well as the awesome racing and overtakes you might get there.
Well, this is your pole setter then, the number 57 of Edgar Pons, his first pole to remind you since Jerez 2015. Jesko Rafin, Hector Garzo join him on the front row of the grid. Keep an eye out for the fast starting Lucas Tulevich on the outside of the second row of the grid. Going down towards that first corner, this 16 lapper is going to be very, very interesting indeed. Look to the top left corner of your screen. When those red lights do come on, then we will be ready to go here at Motorland Aragon for the day's worth of action. So, clutches in. In, breaks on, revs are rising, red lights come on, and we get ready then to go green here in the Moto2 European Championship. Great start from pole setter Edgar Pons and also Jesko Rafin as well as we come down towards the first corner for the first time. Rafin down the inside, he's into the lead of the race at the first corner. Lucas Tulovic getting hung out to dry there as well. He's dropped down just outside of the top five positions, so a bit of a shame there for Tulovic to be losing some ground off the start. Dina Zeki going on the offensive in the early stages as well as he tries to make some good ground through the field. But the big story there is yes. Jesko Rafin, followed by Edgar Pons, followed by the number 14 of Hector Garzo. I think that's pretty much exactly what Pons didn't want to see off the start there. But yeah, like you saw, Tulovic got a bit caught on the outside there and no, uh, no space to make it through. But uh, I'm sure he'll be pretty quick closing that small gap there is between him and Alcoba in fourth. Tommaso Marcon has had an absolute shocker of a start. You can see the number 10 there on the speed up. He started in the middle of the second row in fifth position. He's already down just inside the lower half of the top 10 in ninth position so far. So work to do for the team Chiatti rider. Meanwhile, Chevier Cardalus and the number 20 of Dima Secchi making their way through the field, just trying to fight their way up, of course, at the moment, having both qualified relatively poorly, but still some work to be done for both riders. They come down into the wall for the first time here, Fran, down in towards turn 12. It's such a difficult part of the lap. Yeah, definitely. This track is quite a challenging one, and it's pretty long as well. And then today it's almost like a sapang of a situation with the heat, although obviously it's a lot drier. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a pretty technical track, and uh, there's plenty of... Uh, Plenty of stuff to go out for these guys. Well, Pisa Kierski, the Polish rider then, he is making some good ground as well. Getting there with the pronunciation on that one. It's a bit of a, uh, a tongue twister to get around, but he's trying to find his way through the field. At the moment, he's got Dima Secchi behind him. Here comes Edgar Pons for the race lead, though down into turn 16. The number 57 slides it down the inside, and a brilliant bit of riding there from Edgar Pons. He signals his intentions then right at the end of lap one, but will Rafin have anything in the tank to try and retaliate in these opening stages? Yeah, that was really nicely done. It didn't hold either of up too much either. So you can see Rafin almost looked tempted to have a go there, but just uh, hangs it in behind him. And uh, Garzo's really not that far off these uh, these two. So it'd be interesting to see now what Pons has got, if he'll try and push super early and try and make a gap, or if he's content to just keep that lead and uh, kind of set the pace but not necessarily make it too searing. Well, we know that Edgar Pons has got pace, of course, over the course of uh, one lap. We saw that in qualifying, but we haven't seen his race pace so far this weekend here in the FIM CV Repsol. So it's going to be interesting to see whether he's able to hold on to the end of this 16-lapper, whether he'll have the work in his tyres, whether he'll have the grip left available to him at the end of the race. We know that Jesko Rafin, we saw that, of course, in Estoril. He came strong very, very quickly towards the end of races, especially very good at conserving his tyres. Yeah, definitely. I think Rafin over race distance, you tend to genuinely think, genuinely, generally, uh, think he's probably a little bit better at that management, or he has been so far this season. But then we see Pons already able to pull out a bit of a gap, and Rafin was wide only a little bit, but just enough um, a couple of those corners. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see what happens. Maybe Rafin, of course, is just content to sit there, keep him within, you know, reasonable sight distance, and uh, exactly know that he's hopefully going to have better management of his tyres and the race towards the end. But uh, it's going to be an interesting one, I think, with such high temperatures as well, that can play such a big part in it. Absolutely. Well, that's, of course, a very important factor. As you mentioned, Fran, yesterday it was around about 33, 34 degrees, but it's 37 expected today. Shouldn't be too much of a factor in this first race, but especially going into race two in the latter part of this afternoon, it could be very, very interesting. You can see the field already beginning to spread out there. The top three, Hector Garzo in third position, not really having too much of an answer at the moment to the likes of Rafin and Pons out in front. And again, we've seen this over the course of uh, the last couple of seasons, really, is that uh, number 50, uh, no, sorry, the number 14 of Hector Garzo has good pace in the uh, opening stages of the race, but really does fade towards the end. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, yeah, it should be interesting um, with him and his teammate Tulovic, obviously, who got hung out to dry a little bit at the start, see how they fare as we get through the, through the race laps. But um, I think... Yeah, the temperature is obviously an important thing, but obviously they, they're all in the same situation there. And if they're all kind of have a similar-ish pace, uh, it shouldn't be the deciding factor of the race too much. 
but obviously at the moment we've got about half a second between the two leaders and then Garza is still pretty much in there, you know, not too far off. And then like you say, it's really starting to uh, open up a bit then behind Tulovic definitely, but also, you know, Alcova and Tulovic are slightly in danger here of getting too dropped off that group really to be able to come back to it, I think. Well, this is a really good performance for uh, Mark Alcoba in particular because he's had a bit of a torrid season so far, really. Only two points finishes on the board. One where he finished down in 15th in the opening race of the season. And then he took 11th position. And that, unfortunately, was uh, a little bit further earlier on in this uh, year, actually at uh, race one at uh, Catalonia last time out. So it was, I say it's a long time ago, but it's, it was only really a month ago, the last round of the championship. But it seems like an age ago, really, for Mark Alcoba. And this is easily his best performance. And kind of exactly what, uh, what he needed, really, to be trying to do was just make those steps forward over the course of this year yeah definitely i think as well especially for guys who need a little bit of form but also just want to take that step forward i think it's an important thing to try and do that before we have quite a long summer break for these guys so they can go into that you know feeling like they've got not necessarily momentum because that implies we're going to race again pretty soon but uh, you know just have that form and make that step before the break you can see further down the order opportunistic uh, <laughs> yeah this is uh, Mikel Pons and Chevier Cardaloust going head to head as well just behind them Tommaso Marcon and Marcel Brenner exchanging positions in favour of Marcon on board the team Chiatti speed up here comes the number 18 though of Chevier Cardaloust is he going to find his way alongside here comes Dean Masecki as well in the background no way through there for Cardaloust at that first corner thought about it though yeah definitely thought about it he's been uh, they've been pretty close together for a couple of laps now I think or maybe start to, to get a little bit frustrated there but uh, you can actually try and gain that place on the exit of turn two up the hill so uh, maybe we'll have to see if we can't get that done into turn one at the inside after have a bit of a rethink there certainly will do so going through this first sector it's really fast it's really flowing one of the things though to mention that the TV camera really doesn't do justice as Xavier Cardaloos has more of a look than he's had so far over the course of this race but uh, no way through to the, the Andorran there but it's the undulation really and how much that you have such a huge climb going up until the point where it drops down here into the reverse corkscrew yeah definitely it is hard work walking around <laughs> this track is. it genuinely is it's, uh, it's quite a lot of elevation change and uh, yeah, it doesn't really do it justice on TV. It's like so many tracks that have such huge changes in the altitude is a bit of an extreme word. But uh, like Laguna Seca especially, the court screw looks awesome on TV as well. But when you walk down it, it's unreal how anything can drive down it. But uh, Aragon's not that extreme, but pretty good. And there we can see Cardaloos getting that done just about, I think. Um, so, yeah, nicely done there. Nice and clean. Just aggressive enough, but... Uh, perfectly perfectly judged there well it always seemed the case of when and not if really for uh, Chevier Cardaloos the only uh, which had the tie sheet by the way from Dunlop's come through and the only difference to mention is Mikel Pons on board the number 77 who was just passed he's on the one rear compound of uh, Dunlop so he's on a slightly uh, softer compound of rear tyre which is going to be interesting to see how that fares over the course of this race because it's going well for him in the early stages although having been just been passed by uh, Xavier Cardaloos Cardaloos having a big moment through that final corner though and allowing Mikel Pons to try and find his way through and some big head shaking going through that final corner as well so a mistake there from Cardaloos putting him offline and just forcing a couple of uh, mistakes out of him there in these opening stages. Pretty brave there to keep it that pinned but uh, <laughs> yeah I think Pons maybe um, this Pons of course uh, will be um, maybe not that keen to get into a battle if he does have a bit of a softer tyre in there I think I mean it's going to be quite interesting to see how they fare over race distance with these temperatures in general but if he does have a bit of a softer compound I think that will maybe play on his mind a little bit although uh, obviously they're really going at it at the moment I'm not sure yeah you see quite a lot of people always try that but no one ever really tries to make <laughs> it stick it's ultimately more of a like I'm here remember me it's more of a scaremongering uh, tactic is it not <laughs> yeah but uh, we'll have to see personally I think it looks like there might be room there if you are cheeky enough to do it I think maybe like a Jonathan Ray would possibly make that happen but uh We'll, uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. It's definitely a last lapper, all out, uh, all cards on the table sort of move, that one, isn't it? Down into definitely the reverse full uh, showdown at Imola level of uh, necessity, <laughs> I think, really. But uh, you can see here at the front now, we've got about a second. So again, 5 of 16 laps, that's nothing too much to panic about for Rafine. 
but uh, certainly if Pons can keep up this pace, he'll also see that positively and think he's got quite a nice buffer there. It's more the long game, really, that uh, Jeske Rafin's going to have to play in this race. He knows he's not going to have the pace to attack early on. You can see that as well as he's not attacking in the opening stages of this race. So will he have something, will he have uh, anything left in his locker to try and attack in the latter part of this race? And that, I'm afraid, is that Matthias Megler, is that Alcoba that's gone down? It's one of the Dynavolt bikes, that is for certain. And that is looking like it's going through turn 14, just going past, uh, just going out of the wall rather. And it is, unfortunately, Matthias Megle. So just turned 18 years old yesterday and unfortunately sends it down the road as well. That's a big, big shame there for uh, Matthias Megle, the German rider. The fortunate thing for him is we have got a second race coming up later on here, friends. So he has got another bite at the cherry. Yeah, definitely. And we saw someone just running on there in the background. Not sure exactly who that was. Um, we'll have to see who's not going to come through quite as close as they had been before. But, uh, yeah, obviously shame for him. Although, technically, with his birthday being yesterday, I think the good qualifying can count as the present, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he'll definitely be looking to uh, bounce back in race two. Well, he's trying to bounce back in race one by getting a push from the marshals. He's going downhill, fortunately, which would give him a bit of a helping hand. You can see gravel and all sorts of debris coming out of that bike as he tries to get that push started. They're going to have to be a bit lively about this one because the leaders are already going through the reverse corkscrew. Yeah, obviously, he's... Uh, um, got a bit of a deficit to them anyway and then with the time to crash and then get back up have to uh, try and get that bike back in the race as soon as possible but obviously there is a lot of value for guys like him with not so much experience to just get back in the race as long as you've not got any damage and just uh, get the laps in really and get the experience and especially for race two it'd be important for him to see how the tyres do last and things like that so he can report back to the team and set up better for race two to hopefully have a bit more luck on his side well, the leader, Edgar Pons, still out in front of 1.3 second advantage he has as well. Matthias Megley has called it quits. He's just come down into the pit lane. So a shame there for Matthias Megley's day to end so quickly uh, in the uh, early stages of this one. I can just see next to us as well, Nico Tirol is uh, doing a bit of uh, moonlighting on the, uh, on the Spanish commentary team at the moment as well. We might be able to try and get uh, Nico in for the start of the Moto3 race a bit later on. Let's see what we can do there. But Jesko Rafin, the Swiss rider, second position for him so far. Again, just playing that long game at the moment. In in terms of lap times between the two, they're setting relatively sort of similar pace. Edgar Pons last time around at 154.2, and last time around actually Jesko Rafin is slightly slower on that at 154.7. So he is just dropping a little bit more time, Jesko Rafin. So perhaps here in the mid stages, Fran, we've got Rafin just struggling with pace a little bit. Yeah, definitely. This could be it if Pons really does have this pace and he can keep it to the end. Um, I think, you know, obviously, like you said, a 154.2, that's the fastest lap in the field by a very, very, very big margin. Uh, so Rafin, even though he was half a second slower, is still his closest challenger in terms of that last lap around. And uh, we saw someone just uh, run off in the background. I think that must have been Alcoba because uh, Lukas Tulovic now up into fourth and uh, the next man chasing down his teammate. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to see how that plays out. Obviously, that will be for the for the podium between those two guys. But it is a reasonably sizable gap. So we uh, have to see what happens. But uh, I think, in general, in this kind of temperature, it's also a game of sort of pacing yourself a bit as well. Uh, especially these guys, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult out there. 36, 37 degrees, it's very, very hot. And uh, the race can seem quite long, especially Moto2 is definitely usually more of a long game like you said there's no other craziness and frenetic overtaking of motor three uh, so there's a lot of kind of mental a, a lot of the mental game to play about it as well but uh, definitely i think pons is going to have the edge here and he's definitely quicker at the moment but it is you know second and a half it's not too extreme at the moment we'll have to see and then garzo obviously hasn't really been dropped off that battle too much yet either well, don't count your chickens just yet because uh, there's still plenty of the race to go. Anything can really happen in the uh, Moto2 European Championship. Anything can happen in motorsport. It usually does. You can still see here Tommaso Marcon. He's going on the attack against Xavier Card. Loose going down in towards turn 16. He pulls to the inside on the speed up. He gets the move done and dusted. So he is up into... Uh, seventh position at the moment just behind uh, Mikel Pons they are uh, so far and you can see there Mikel Pons on board that number 77 so keeping that soft tyre working pretty nicely at the moment as they come over the timing line down in towards that first corner you can still see Marcel Brenner and Dimas Eki just going head to head as well and I was talking to um, 
the birthday boy a couple of weeks ago of uh, Lucas Tulovic in uh, the Tech 3 machine, and he's running in fourth position in this race so far. Uh, I said to him this morning, I was saying, well, what's, uh, what do you reckon for the race? And he said, well, the problem is the lap here is so long that the gaps are magnified, really, compared to the shorter circuits that we go to over the course of the uh, season. So it really does make it quite hard over the course of a race to keep that gap at a consistent when you're just a couple of tenths of a second slower. Yeah, definitely. That was what was so impressive when we had Granado versus Cardus here, and it was so, so close. Because uh, like uh, like Tulevich says, it's a long lap here. It's a, it really is quite, a, it's a five kilometers um, and it's just quite technical as well. So it really can magnify those gaps. But so far, like these guys have got a great battle here. I think Cardaloose will be starting to get a bit frustrated that he seems to constantly be the one on the receiving end here. But uh, we'll have to see. There's some great racing from these guys. And uh, it's come down a couple of tenths at the front. So, um, and that last lap around, Rafine was a bit faster than Pond, so we'll have to see how that's going to play out. It could just have been one incredible lap, just aimed at pulling that pin and pulling that gap out a bit to give him some breathing space, or maybe Rafine's now going to answer back a bit, we'll have to see. Well, it's taking a constant it is so far. Oh, and Chevier Cardaloose has gone down as well at turn 14. Oh, my goodness me. They just managed to avoid him. He clung onto the bike for dear life going through there. That could have been so much worse for Chevier Cardaloose, but he just lost the front end going through the right-hander. Kept held onto the bike in full Mark Marquez style, trying to save it on his elbow. Uh, managed to get the bike picked up. And let's have another look at a replay of uh, this incident here there, Fran. We can just pick it up and have a look, another look and see what happened. So just going down the hill onto the brakes, front end goes, saves it on his elbow, and he's just holding onto it really for, for dear life going through there. He's looking at the rest of the field going through, and he was so, so lucky going through there. He really was there, yeah, definitely. Like you could see, like you say, a bit of an attempt to do a Marquez in the early stages of that crash, but very, very quickly, there's no way you're going to get back up from that. Um, so, yeah, I think pretty lucky you didn't get hit there. It's one of those times, you know, it's easy to... You want to feel like you want to hang on to the bike like for as long as you have to but uh, sometimes like that i don't know it's maybe a little bit too much and should have maybe let go and tried to uh, make sure he's out of the way there but we'll have to see if he can get restarted there shouldn't be too much damage it's fairly low drama incident in terms of the impact with the floor but uh, yeah luckily he's okay and uh, managed to get out of the way there well, it is round five of the FIM CV Repsol for the Moto2 European Championship. And just thinking about the World Championship for 2019 as well. Some interesting talking points going in there as well, of course, because Triumph are coming in as the new engine supplier with their 765cc three-cylinder engine for the 2019 season onwards. And they've actually been testing that bike here, Fran, as well, with a, a few riders who have been um, in the FIM CV Repsol's Moto2 European Championship in years gone by. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that fans out. It's definitely going to be interesting. Like you say, they've had a test here, which was um, Jonas Folger was up here testing for Calex, obviously the most prolific of the Moto2 chassis manufacturers at world level, certainly. He is testing that Triumph engine in the Calex, and then Alex Marquez has had a go in it as well. They've also tested at Bruno, um, and I was talking to Folger about the new engine and what he thought of it and how he thought it was maybe going to change the class. And he was saying because it's got a lot more torque, um, you essentially have to ride it much more like a MotoGP machine. Uh, and he said that it should really make that step not easier, but it should definitely mean that it's a lot closer together in terms of riding style between Moto2 and the Premier class. And that adaptation should be a lot easier rather than at the moment you kind of have Moto2, Moto3 rather than you have to adapt to Moto2 and then you have to adapt everything again to MotoGP. So uh, it's going to be an interesting one, I think, and especially with guys like Alex Marquez now confirmed staying on for next year. Um, that should be a good one, and he should um, you know, gain quite a lot from that experience, I should think. And another thing to mention as well is, of course, the difference in sound. We're going to be getting a lot more of a, a deeper burble as opposed to the high-pitched scream that we get from these Honda CBR600RR engines, which are currently in the uh, motorcycles. And uh, a lot remains to be seen for the, the European Championship as well for 2019, whether we'll change over to Triumph engines for next year or whether we'll stick with the uh, Hondas for another season. Still a lot of interest and a lot of intrigue going on there because teams are still sort of waiting to find out which direction they're going in.
in, whether they're going to be having to fork out for new Calix chassis, because of course they'll have to have something that fits the new engine, because it's a lot narrower than these Hondas are, and uh, still all a lot to play for though going on through there, and I, I dare say if they stuck with the uh, CBR 600 RR Fram, we could have quite a big grid in 2019 here in the European Championship. Yeah, definitely, I think it's going to be interesting, obviously it'll be interesting in the World Championship, because it's the debut of the new engine, a lot of things will change, obviously Moto2's been exactly the same in terms of the the engine since it was introduced as a class in 2010 but i think as well yeah it could have some really interesting knock-on effects here um, and there'll be a lot of machinery with those engines in and uh, a lot of opportunity i think for people who maybe want to come here and race so it could be an interesting year i think i think it'll be an interesting season in the world championship uh, and quite a lot of pressure as well because obviously the honda's shown itself to be super super reliable and uh, everyone's really got used to that as the Moto2 engine. Obviously, like I said, it's been there since inception. But uh, it's pretty exciting. And like you said, that was a lovely word, that burble. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I think it's, it just sounds wonderful. So uh, it's going to be a pretty interesting uh, season, I think. Back to the on-track action. You can just see Mikel Pons getting the better of number 10, Tommaso Marcon. That's still for sixth position. They've really managed to... Uh, gap the rest of uh, the battle of the likes of uh, Dina Zecchi and as Alessandro Zaccone and these two really going head to head in the final few laps of this race actually a battle for fifth position I apologize as well between the uh, two so Alcoba versus Tommaso Marcon and they're doing an absolutely uh, brilliant job at the moment no in fact I apologize it is it's uh, yeah it is a battle for sixth position the graphic on screen is uh, is incorrect there I was right the first time should have gone with my guts it was, and I was trying to be rude to you as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a great duel, this. Even though they've lost card loose from the three-way battle, these two are still really close together on track. Some great moves. And like, it's pretty impressive they managed to keep themselves in clear air because quite often when you have such a big fight, it can really cost you some serious time and you end up with the guy behind then catching you up. And uh, as has happened in another race series today, then just getting straight past you and then uh, taking it from you. But uh, <laughs> won't do, uh, give you any spoilers there. I tell you what, though, as well, Fran here, Yes, Rafine is uh, just dropping back ever so slightly. He's just getting a lap, to, uh, just getting past a lap rider. That's Philippe Legallo who's getting the back off. But if he drops off pace any more, then he's going to have uh, to be thinking a little bit more about the man who's just a bit too far in the background to be of any threat at the moment. That's the number fourteen of Hector Garzo. Yeah, it's starting to look a little bit more like that's the bigger threat now, isn't it? I think that lead looks pretty secure unless there's a mistake from Pons or some really serious tyre deg on the last few laps I think that it looks like Pons has really um, just got the pace to keep that, it's now about two and a half seconds so that's a sizeable gap and uh, yeah again he's just a, a sizeable chunk quicker last time round as well and the lap before well, Hector Garzo there, you can see, well, that's actually Philippe Legallo, the uh, Stock 600 rider, just having a long look over his shoulder. 60 years old he is, believe it or not. I still cannot believe every time we say that he's 60 years old and he's just going out for a Sunday ride, I reckon, he tells his, he tells his wife. But he comes out here and races, and if I'm able to raise a smile, let alone my leg over a motorbike at the age of 60, then uh, I'll be doing half as well as he is. I think that's the maybe you've got slightly extreme vision of what it's like <laughs> to be 60. It's not, you know, well, what know 95. <laughs> but, uh... I'm 21 going on 60 now. That's half the problem. <laughs> oh, dear. But, uh, no, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? And obviously, you know, like... It's just great to be able to do it, and it's great to see that kind of thing. Not quite the same situation as we had sort of with, like, Jeremy McWilliams getting back in Moto2 a few years ago. But, uh, you know, obviously, if he wants to race, it's certainly more than quick enough to qualify and be on the grid. So, you know, it's just good to see. Yeah, good old Jeremy McWilliams, as you say there as well, and he's got a heck of a moustache on him. I don't know what that's got to do with anything. I'm just complimenting <laughs> his moustache more than anything. Anyway, back to <laughs> the front. I can't believe you've mentioned moustaches and you're not going to talk about Josh Brooks. Well, I know. He's got, he had a heck of a moustache, but he doesn't did, anymore. He's, <laughs> he's taken it off, hasn't he? Anyway, back to the action, and you can see uh, it's a scooter on the circuit in the background I can see there. So he's, what on earth is going on there at the far end of the uh, track? It's not live on the circuit, fortunately, but that was, that was very strange as well, just going off of, I, I want to say one of the escape roads, and it is, but still, very interesting um, set of circumstances going on there. Meanwhile, back to the action on track, Jesko Rafin, second place so far. Uh, the gap between himself and Hector Garzo between second and third place at the moment, still around about five seconds there and thereabouts, but now a bit of clear air for Hector Garzo, and you can see that he has closed visually on uh, the number two 
of Jeske Rafinha over the last few laps or so. Let's see whether that gap does come down. In terms of lap times, they were around about half a second adrift there and thereabouts, so it's not going to be uh, this time around for him, unfortunately. But let's see whether that does change over the last few laps here. You can see here Hector Garzo, Spanish rider, of course, has raced in the World Championship, did so in 2008, uh, 17 rather, when he substituted uh, this time uh, last year for the injured uh, Remy Gardner. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, sorry, uh, rather I should say Chevy Vieja he was substituting for, that was at the Saxon Ring, and then Fatty Performance he put in in qualifying, sadly it all went to, uh, all went to pot in the race. So let's see how he fares over the remainder of this one. He's on course for a, a very lonely podium, it must be said. The top three having spread out quite significantly, as we do tend to see in the Moto2 European Championship. Tulovic there still in fourth place. Mark Alcoba inside the top five. Mikel Pons in the top six as well. And uh, Mikel Pons still going head-to-head -head with Tommaso Marcon for that top six position. No way through at the moment for Tommaso Marcon on board that team Chiatti speed up down in towards the right-hander and then flicking it left on towards this 968 meter long back straight I tell you what it really does seem like it's quite short on board these uh, Moto2 machines however when you walk that straight especially in heat such as we have today it really is quite a long feat yeah definitely like we were saying earlier it's a bit of a challenge to walk the track even though <laughs> without having to uh, jog it or uh, or ride it but uh, I think now we've got almost three seconds for Rafine uh, to try and catch up, it's not going to happen, definitely, is it? So uh, I think now all eyes on trying to consolidate that second. Obviously, he's got such a lead that he can afford to do that and take the points, and consistency is really the key. Certainly is. It's uh, going to be interesting to see how they fare in race two, as well as we said, with the hotter track temperatures. And these guys, of course, being spread out on the circuit. And it does make it interesting to see what their consistency is over in terms of uh, lap times. Not necessarily, of course, in terms of when they're battling, but when they've got a bit of free air and they're dueling uh, on uh, track to try and set faster lap times after one another. And often being consistent when you're in clear air can be quite the uphill challenge. And yes, Gary, I think doing a very good job. His lap times having been relatively consistent over the course of the race. He's now down into the low one minute 55 second laps here at the moment, Fran. So as you said, they're not having an answer for um, Edgar Pons at the moment on board that AGR bike. And that'll be AGR's first win in quite a long time, actually, as well, because they didn't manage to get on the top step in 2000 and um, 17, uh, at least in the latter half of it. So uh, let's see what they're going to be able to do. Yeah, I think this is the kind of form a lot of people expected from the start of the season, like I said to you at the start of the broadcast. So uh, I think for Pons, it's really great to be back on that top step. And like you say, it's great for the team as well. It's been quite a wait for both. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good win. And I think it's pretty interesting now as well, now that obviously Fernandez has gone, moved up to the World Championship. Um, it's yeah, it's a nice signal of intent really from Edgar Pons to say, you know, this isn't going to go all your own way. I'm here and I'm uh, here to definitely take points off you and uh, give a good run at this. So, yeah, pretty good. And obviously you can see Rafi now a little bit closer, but it's still over two seconds, although it doesn't look it from that camera angle. They look an awful lot closer. But uh, so, yeah, it's a pretty dominant win. It'd be interesting, I think, to see in race two as well what Rafi can, uh, can bring to the party then. Yeah, certainly will do. Let's see what he's going to uh, be able to do. I'm just having a, a quick look back through my stats here as well. And uh, AGR didn't actually win a race uh, at all last year. So it will be actually back in uh, 2015, I believe, actually, when Edgar Pons was riding for this very team when the, was the last time that they uh, took a race victory here in the Moto2 European Championship. But uh, Edgar Pons, as we said, having done an absolutely brilliant job. In fact, I apologise, of course, what am I thinking of? 2016, Stephen Odendahl when he won the championship. There we go, yeah. Portimao was the uh, last time that he won a race. I didn't want to interrupt you and uh, <laughs> just shout Stephen Odendahl, but uh, yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, like you say, winless season for them last season, so it's great to be back on that top step. And uh, I think it'll give them a boost and like it'll give uh, Edgar a good boost as well, I think. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Rafine copes with it now. If he's got to sort of you know take that second place towards the end of the year to just keep that lead it'd be interesting to see how he reacts to that but uh, who knows it could all change again later in the day certainly could do you never know what is going to happen should uh, mention as well for Edgar Pons he's the sole AGR rider here this weekend uh, because there is no Benny Solis on board the other machine so the American rider not here this weekend for reasons that are not quite certain at the moment but uh, with a bit of luck we'll see Benny Solis out before the end of the 2018 season here in the FIM CEV Repsol was making some good steps forward on board that bike meanwhile 
This man here, Jesker Rafin, well, he would love to be in a world championship seat in 2019 as well. And he's doing everything he needs to do, really. He's, he doesn't need to win this race to keep his championship advantage at quite a, uh, a stable gap. His nearest rival, of course, Augusto Fernandez, now racing in the world championship for the Pons team. So uh, he doesn't have to worry too much about the immediate threats behind him, which is something that's going to be uh, comforting to him in some ways. Yeah, definitely. But I think as well for Rafin, it's like I was saying before, it's an interesting one because essentially he's here to stamp some serious authority on this championship and show that he needs to go back to the world championship and get another ride there. So obviously, whilst the consistent and in many ways the clever way to win a title is quite often build up that lead and then protect it and take the points and ride sensibly, that's not the way you impress, especially when you've already had that chance and then you've come back down here and you want to really show, like, you know, he's probably aiming to win every single race for the remainder of the season because that's what he has to demonstrate rather than necessarily focusing on the best way to win that championship because he's done that before. But uh, I don't know, it will be an interesting one. We'll have to see. Maybe, uh, maybe it's all not that extreme and... Uh, <laughs> He'll just uh, take those points and make sure he just take another crown here. We'll uh, we'll see. He has been to quite a few MotoGP events this year, Jesco Rafim. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does do next year and how it plays out for, for both of these top two guys. Yep, got a fourth place at Phillip Island last year, did uh, Jesco Rafim when he was in the World Championship. So he certainly does have some pace about him. But again, last year was a bit of a mixed bag, that fourth place being really the only standout result he had of the 2000 and 17 season you can see here the swiss rider just going hard on the brakes through past the wall of turn number 12 then into the uh, right hander of turn 13 which follows edgar pons here the race leader a clear track between him and the checker flag all he's got to do is just negotiate it through two more corners after this one and he will be home and dry for his uh, first victory since the 2016 season it really has been a very impressive performance here from pons he managed to get the lead back from yes garafin in the opening stages of the race and he hasn't really been touched at all since then. Going down then in towards turn number 16. Just one more corner after this one from home. Slight wobble on the front end for Edgar Pons. It has been a challenging couple of years for him in the World Championship, but he is back on form here in the Moto2 European Championship. Edgar Pons wins for the first time in the FIM CV Repsol since 2015. Jesker Rafin comes home in second place. A brilliant performance from the top two. Third place is going to be Hector Garzo, the Spanish rider, finishes on the rostrum as well for the first time this season. Great stuff from the Spaniard of Garzo. Great stuff as well for Edgar Pons, the race leader and the race winner there. A dominant performance and he never looked challenged over the course of that race. Lucas Tulovic coming home in fourth place. Jerry, sorry, Jeremy Alcoba, Mark Alcoba, I should say, on the Dynavolt in Tech Junior team. Easily his best result inside the top five. Brilliant performance from him. He will be absolutely elated with that result. Good stuff for both team and the rider. Mikel Pons comes home in seventh place and it's Dimazeki inside the top eight so he managed to really salvage what's otherwise been a very challenging result and the top super stock 600 rider is this man here Alessandro Zetti on board the Yamaha R6 he's all on his own 14th place so we'll get a couple of points on the board but uh, it has been a bit of a lonely race for the Italian so far this weekend as we can see just going through those final couple of corners at Yamaha R6 of course we have seen a Yamaha fighting at the sharp end of the grid this year, believe it or not. That was the first race of the 2018 season when we had uh, the Portuguese rider there in the Portuguese round at uh, Estoril winning that race. An incredible performance it was from Evo Lopez back then. And you can see here as well for Miguel Pons and uh, also, sorry, for Edgar Pons rather, and for uh, Hector Garzo here on board the number 14, having some flags to wave, of course, in memory of Andreas Perez, of course, as we said at the start of the broadcast, Andreas Perez, just 14 years of age, sadly lost his life in the FIM CV Repsol in round four of the championship. So paying tribute to the number 77 on the slowdown lap, you can see there for Hector Garzo. Really good to see there. Edgar Pons as well, your race leader, just coming down that back straight. Brilliant performance it was from him. You can see there a winning time of 34 minutes and 34 seconds. So good performance from him. And uh, his fastest lap actually was a 1 minute 53.948. So that was around about a second or so slower over the course, or a second or so quicker, rather, I should say, of uh, his nearest rivals around him. So he really did have some good pace in his back pocket, did Edgar Pons there. And he will be celebrating 
throughout the course of, well, this morning, really, until the next race comes along in the afternoon. Good performance there for Edgar Pons. Great for the AGR team to be on top for the first time since Portugal 2016. Maybe this man here can do something a little bit different next time out. That, of course, is Jesko Rafin. Try a different setup on that bike and give him an opportunity to be fighting at the sharp end once again. And there we go. We can see him just congratulating with his team. We'll be down there talking to Edgar Pons. Fran will be down there just catching a few words and seeing what he has to say after that race. It really has been a very, very impressive performance from him. And a great performance also for uh, Jesko Rafin, as we said. Top three, of course, Hector Garzo in third position. He'll be rolling down pit lane very, very shortly in towards the Park Ferme area. Here is Hector Garzo as well. A good performance from him after what has been, I think, even by his own admission, a challenging 2000 and 18 campaign for him so far. He'll be very impressed with that result because it has been a difficult time for him on board that Mistral machine. Of course, Tech 3 not going to be running their own machinery in the Moto2 World Championship in 2019 as well. So it remains to be seen whether they'll continue that uh, challenge and continue running them that outfit for next year. Edgar Pons on top then ahead of Jesko Rafin, Hector Garzo, Lucas Tulovic, Mark Alcoba inside your top five, Tommaso Mark on in sixth place, Mikel Pons in seventh, team is Eki inside your top eight with Alessandro Zaccone. The Italian on the Calix looks quite strong in that race but sadly only finished in ninth position. Marcel Brenner inside the top ten, um, then Peter Bierskirski, uh, the Polish rider, we'll get my tongue around that eventually, Chevier Carlos, Mark Chiodo, then uh, Alessandro Zetti, your top six stock, 600 rider ahead of Roman Fischer, completing the top 15 points finishers. Charlie Cooper just missing out on points ahead of Luis Pomares and Giacomo Lorenzon, then Philippe Legallo, the last of the classified runners. Alessandro Anin and Matthias Megley, sadly failing to finish that race. Matthias Megley, of course, we saw with that crash, and uh, Alexander Anin not making the checker flag for one reason or another. You can see down there in Park Ferme, a great atmosphere here at Motorland Aragon in the FIM CV Repsol. We had the uh, pit lane walk just before the start of action here today, and it really was great to see so many people down there in the pit lane meeting their uh, racing heroes. Catching up so, with Edgar, riders. incredible race there, down and from Paul, your Ferme. first win of the season. How does it feel? Well, it feels, it feels great, no? Uh, we've been working really hard with the team, getting the bike perfect for, for my style, no? And, and here, since the test, we really feel really good with the bike, so, so yeah, it has been good. All the weekend, we have been really riding really fast, no? really doing really good lap times. And, yeah, the race, uh, the start was not really good. Uh, it would make a lot of wheelie and just go past me. But I, was, I managed to pass him quick and try to push really fast because at the beginning the tires has a lot of grip, no? so you can push really hard. So I tried to push hard and I make a small gap. And then I was just trying to, little by little, going a bit more. So then I could control a bit. And, yeah, it was really hard race also for the, for the heat. And second one will be even harder. <laughs> Y ahora en castellano también, por favor. Pues sí, muy contento, ¿no? Hemos estado trabajando mucho con el equipo para tener la moto sobre todo a mi gusto, ¿no? A mi estilo de pilotaje. Y desde el entreno que venimos aquí nos hemos sentido muy bien. Hemos rodado muy rápido, constantemente. Y, y nada, el fin de semana ha ido muy bien. Hemos estado rodando en tiempos muy buenos, la verdad. Y conseguimos la pole ayer. Por la tarde, bueno, en la mañana tuvimos una pequeña caída. El equipo, la verdad es que montó la moto en un momento, hicieron un gran trabajo. Y bueno, la carrera, la salida no ha estado muy bien. No he soltado demasiado bien el embrague y se me ha levantado. Eh, Jesco me ha pasado. Y, pero bueno, después he conseguido pasarlo rápido, apretar y poco a poco ir dejando de atrás. Así que después solo he sido ir controlando la distancia y sobre todo conservar, ¿no? porque con este calor es, es muy complicado conducir, sobre todo cuando se llega hasta el neumático, se te cierra mucho adelante y de atrás tienes mucho spinning, ¿no? así que ir suave lo máximo posible con la moto y, y bien. Gracias. Edgar Pons on top for the first time since 2015. And here is how the race then panned out in the Moto2 European Championship. You can see that Edgar Pons got a good start, but Yes, Rafin got an even better one. He led into the first corner as the rest of the field sorted themselves out. A couple of riders just running a little bit wide there and losing a bit more ground than they would have liked going through the first couple of turns. Di Maseki was also on the attack as well, just finding his way past his fellow riders. Meanwhile, Yes, Rafin's lead was quickly brought into, really, more than anything, with the number 57 of Edgar Pons trying to find his way past, and he did so at the end of lap two, going down the 
back straight in towards the final couple of corners. He found his way up the inside through turn 16, then into the final corner of turn number 17. And that was really him never to be seen again. The top three then began to spread out really over the course of the race as the gaps increased, the lap times stayed pretty much the same all of them having relatively different pace to one another, causing those big gaps. Here was Xavier Codluce trying to get his way past uh, Mikel Pons, finding his way through up the inside of turn number 13. However, going into the next corner, it all went uh, a little bit wrong for him, though not on that occasion. Losing the front end through there, which I'm sure we'll see in the uh, few moments of this race. But this was a nice little battle, actually, between Mikel Pons and Xavier Cardelouse as they went into the uh, left-hander in the opening stages. That was turn number four. They were just going through there. And this is where Xavier Card loose. His race really came undone. He was going through the right hander here, losing the front end, tried to hold onto that bike for a very long time, but frighteningly really came back onto the track over the racing line and was very lucky to be avoided by the rest of the field. Meanwhile, Edgar Pons, well, he looked calm, confident, in control and did an absolutely brilliant performance behind the handlebars of the number 57 AGR team, Calex. Never to be seen again, he was. Out of the final corner he came and over the timing line to take the chequered flag and an absolutely brilliant race win for the Spanish rider. Back on top. The first win for AGR since Portimao 2016 as well. It does mean a lot to both team and to the rider. Jesco Rafin, the Swiss championship leader, finishing in second position as well. And you can see, of course, Hector Garzo, who finished in third place there. So, making their way onto the podium are your top three finishers. Brilliant performance all round from all of the riders there. Of course, they'll get their trophies, they'll get uh, the champagne, sorry, or rather the uh, Freshnet to spray on the rostrum. First of all, the team's trophy presented to AGR. And they uh, will be taking that moment, I'm sure, smiling from ear to ear, whatever happens for the rest of the day following that win in race number one. Next of all, the Stock 600 winner, presented with that trophy there. Great performance from uh, Alessandro Zetti on board the number eight for the Foul 55 racing team, taking his first Stock 600 win of the season. Eita Garzo, his first podium of 2018 as well, after what has been a very challenging time so far this year. And then Jesko Rafin as well, taking that second place trophy, extending his lead in the championship as well. Slightly mixed body language as well on the face of the Swiss rider. He'll have been hoping for just a little bit more in that race. Maybe he can do something in the hotter temperatures this afternoon. And, well, there's no questions about this man here and his performance. Brilliant stuff from Edgar Pons. He will be absolutely thrilled with that result. And he gets a petrol check as well. So some free uh, petrol to take on the way home. Thrilling stuff for Edgar Pons. And now time for then the Spanish National Anthem. Spanish National Anthem plays out for Edgar Pons and the AGR team then here at Motorland Aragon. Spanish rider, Spanish team. A match made in heaven at the Spanish circuit as well. And now time to spray the champagne on the podium. Really good stuff from them. And the mechanics down there getting a coating. They won't be getting too much of a coating because there's another race to come later on this afternoon. Very, very good performance, though, from your top three. Great race there. And you can see as well, it's Alejandro Zetti. Just a little bit too young to be spraying the champagne on the podium there. Meanwhile, final results then. And in fact, oh, sorry, championship standings, I should say, from that race. Yesco Rafin 
now has a 30-point advantage over Augusto Fernandez. Fernandez, of course, not in the championship anymore. So Edgar Pons, his nearest championship rival, 57 points adrift is Edgar Pons over Jesko Rafin. Then Hector Garzo, Di Masecki, Lucas Tulovic, you can see there as well. Chevy Cardaluce inside the top 10, despite not scoring any points during that race. He'll be hoping for a little bit more and a change in fortune for uh, his second race of the weekend later on this afternoon. Ivo Lopez, the emphatic Portuguese winner in 11th position. Really was full gas for him at Estoril, was it not? You can see there the various runners and riders further down the order as well. Roman Fischer getting some points on the board. The uh, Polish newcomer as well, Peter Biasikierski in 21st position. Good performance there from him, and uh, really good to see as well what they had to say over the course of that race there. Edgar Pons as well, Fran, he said that uh, he was really struggling with the heat, as I can imagine were all of the riders. Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously saying like he went for those tactics and uh, paid off.